Good morning and welcome to the Elliott Coffee Talk here at Roberts Library. For those of you who may not know why it's named Elliott Coffee Talk, it's named after our first librarian who served back in 1919 to 1957. Very long, uh, very long time, time at any one institution. He may hold the record. Uh, for being uh, in, in one place. So it's a pleasure to be at Roberts Library. And uh, what's particularly notable about Dr. Elliott was, besides his long term, he was the founding president of the American Theological Library Association. So if you are a researcher in any way, you have used the ATLA index. So Dr. Elliott, was fundamental in creating a lot of the things that we enjoy in our research and in our world in, in theological libraries and, and in seminaries and academic institutions that study religion. So we're happy to have the Elliott Coffee Talk and today inaugurating our first student-led paper is Scott Robertson and he is going to talk about the letter of Titus and a little bit about Scott. Uh, I understand that you are going to do some papers for the Society of Biblical Literature, is that correct? And uh, ASOR, correct? And so we're awfully proud to have him giving our first student talk here. And so we'll turn it over to you, brother. Thank you for showing up for cookies and coffee. <laughs> Enduring this. So this, do what? <laughs> so this morning we're we're going to talk about the letter to Titus, um, in particular, its Cretan background and how that informs our reading of the letter to Titus, and particularly how it informs our reading of the opponents that are discussed very briefly in the letter to Titus. So, an interesting thing about Crete. Everyone know where Crete was? Enlightenment. Enlightenment. It's in the Aegean Sea. It's part of Greece, the largest of the Greek islands. They're at the very bottom of the Aegean Sea. And it had a very interesting cultural background. Even though it was part of the Aegean, it had its own distinct culture. So let's start by looking at the cultural background of Crete. So we have to start with pre-Roman Crete. One of our main sources for pre-Roman Crete is the historian Strabo, writing in about the first century CE. Now Strabo, for all of his quirks, he, can, he tends to be trusted on the area of Crete because his grandmother was from Knossos, the main city on the northern side of the island, on the Aegean side of the island. Now what Strabo tells us about um, the cultural background of Crete is the men tended to have their own little society. They would meet in these dining halls called Andrea. And there they would have their meals provided by the community. This sort of communal dining experience, only for men. But interestingly, it was headed by a woman. So the women had their own little side here, the men had their own side. And within this male structure, they were separated according to age. So you had the older men, the younger men, and the children. But the children would not eat with the men. It was later until they had reached adulthood or semi-adulthood that they would eat in the Andrea. Now, one, particular, one particularly interesting thing about Creed that Strabo mentions is in regard to women. Now, at a certain age, the men and women would marry in this communal marriage ceremony. Everyone of this certain age or at this place in life would be married at the same time. Now after they were married, the women and the men were not allowed to cohabitate, even though they were married, until the woman had become able to manage a household. She had to become a, a worker in the home in order for them to cohabitate according to their, their customs. And that was the job of the older women in the community to teach these young men, to, young women, to manage the household. 
Now going back even farther, the law code of Gorton, the main city on the southern side of Crete. Now I'm going to be looking at all of Crete because Titus tells us that, um, that Titus was to appoint elders in every city of Crete. So we're looking at a pan-Cretan uh, setting here. So the law code of Gorton was inscribed around the 5th century BCE, considered one of the oldest, if not the oldest, law code in Europe. And the Greeks themselves considered it the proto-law code of all of theirs. It's sort of, <clears throat> whether this is true or not, this is what the Greeks thought, was that their laws derived from this particular law code, especially the law code of Sparta, uh, came, has a close connection there. Now the way they described women in this was that they were able to initiate divorce, inherit property. This was quite progressive for their, for their age, that women had their own standing in society alongside men. It was not as progressive as today. Women could not run for the president of Greece, um, but they, if there was one, but they still had their own place in society. Now this unique structure of society is, is we find it also within the archeology span of ancient Crete. Now the main household style of Greece in general was your, court, your court, courtyard style house. Sort of a circular building or square building with a courtyard in the middle. And this was helpful because you could keep women in one, one part and keep men in the other part. Women's utensils could be over here, men's utensils could be over here, and they didn't need to, to mix in any way. You could keep the genders very separate. Now in Crete, you have a different style of house as the predominant architectural type, and that's a linear house, where, just like it sounds, you have essentially a line of rooms, so that in order to get, from, to get to one room, you have to go through the other rooms. And within these, we found mixtures of utensils used for both men and women. It was impossible in this style of house to cordon off women from men. There was some sort of intermixture of the, of the genders much more so than in Greece as a whole. Now within the religion of Crete, they also found themselves to be quite distinct. The Cretans saw themselves as being the birthplace of most of the gods, uh, particularly Zeus, the, uh, one of the main deities of, of Crete and of Greece in general. But interestingly, Crete, the Cretans also considered themselves to have the tomb of Zeus, According to their mythology, Zeus died on Crete, which was a source of, of heckling for other, other Greeks. Callimachus could write, oh, Cretans are always liars because we know you, O oh Zeus, are eternal, but they claim to have your tomb. So this is, a, this is what Crete looked like before the Romans took over. They were their own entity. Now, Rome came in in the mid-first century BCE. Very interestingly, the rest of the Aegean world had been conquered by, by Rome at this point. Greece was sort of an outlier in the middle of the Roman Empire. And the Romans claimed that there was a lot of piracy going on in Crete. Probably not entirely accurate, but they needed a reason to take over Crete. And so, in, they decided to, to fight the Cretans. And the Cretans didn't take this very lightly. In fact, they had to besiege Knossos, the largest city, one of the largest cities on Crete. And eventually, the Romans took over. And as a reward for their, for their incessant denial of Roman rule, they placed a colony there to impose Roman rule quite heavily upon the Cretans. So Knossos became a colony. Gorton became the capital, which took away Knossos's leading city <clears throat> status, gave it to Gorton. And at that time, Crete was combined with Cyrene on the North African coast, separating it from, from Greece and taking away its own status as its own place 
At this time, we see an imperial mint placed at Knossos, where they started minting coins with Latin on them. Other places were allowed to mint coins with Greek on them, but Knossos received Latin coins, a distinct impression that Rome was here. We find Latin public inscriptions around the island, another distinct statement that Rome is here. However, the Cretans did not respond to this by taking over Roman culture. Instead, they decided to keep their own culture well into the end of the first century CE, into the beginning of the second century CE, where we start to see a shift. But we see at Knossos distinct pottery styles going on right next to each other. We see the Roman pottery style, but the Cretans remaining firm in their traditional styles. We see Greek private inscriptions. The people did not make their own inscriptions in Latin. They kept Greek as their main language. And even more so, they started to revive the ancient Cretan dialect, making a further statement that we are not Roman, we are Cretan. And further, we see them retaining Greek names, Cretan names, in fact, instead of Roman Latinized names. So here within Roman Crete, we see this very interesting mixture of Roman, Cretan going on in the first century CE. They're there, there's something going on, there's some sort of admixture, but the Cretan idea of who they were was they were resistant at the core. They tended to, to have some negotiation on the fringes, but in the first century they were quite resistant. Now further, there was a Cretan stereotype going on in the ancient world. In the ancient world, where you were from determined who you were, determined your personality. You could know, by knowing one Greek, you could know all Greeks. By knowing one Cretan, you could know all Cretans. Ptolemy, a math, uh, not a math magician, but a mathematician, sorry, <laughs> and geographer from Alexandria in the second century, he writes, a more general destiny takes precedence of all particular considerations, namely that a country of birth to which the major details of a geniture are natu naturally subordinate, such as the topics of the form of the body, the character of the soul, and the variations of manner and customs. So wherever you were determined who you, are, who you were, wherever you were from. Now, one of the Cretan stereotypes which remained was that they liked to retain their own culture. Plutarch writes in his On Brotherly Love, um, when he's talking about Cretans, he says that they, though they often quarreled with one another against each other, made up their differences and united when outside enemies attacked. And this it was, which they called syncretism. The word syncretism was coined by the very idea that Cretans would join together to expel that which was coming from the outside. They liked to retain who they were in the midst of outside threats. Now while we're on the subject of this, there, there are some other characteristics that the ancients saw as being particularly Cretan, which are important for the letter to Titus. Interestingly, Cretans are known as liars. If you're a Cretan, you are a liar. As I talked about earlier, Callimachus wrote that the Cretans say that they had the tomb of Zeus, which we all know Zeus is eternal, he can't die. So he labeled them a liar. In fact, they coined the verb kratidzo, to Cretanize, meaning to lie. In fact, Polybius writes, um, when talking about a couple of people, he says, he therefore informed him that it was impossible for him to come out of the citadel at the present moment, but that he would send three or four of his friends, and after that, and after they had joined um, Melancholmus, he would himself get ready to leave. Achaius indeed was doing his best, but he did not consider that, as the saying is, he was a lying Cretan, or pros creta cretid zone, that he was playing the Cretan. Further, Cretans were seen as very greedy. 
Um, in fact, Polybius goes on to say that they were greedy so much, in fact, do sordid love of gain and lust for wealth prevail among them, that the Cretans are the only people in the world in whose eyes no gain is disgraceful. <laughs> Them's fighting words. They didn't, they did not like that. <clears throat> Furthermore, the Cretans were very hostile. They saw them as very mean people. Poly Polybius apparently didn't like the Cretans because he, he's, he further notes that the Cretans are involved in constant broils with pr both public and private in murders and civil wars. The, so part of what it was to be a Cretan in the ancient world was you resisted attacks from the outside, banded together with people that you hate, much like the 2016 election, yeah. <laughs> um, you, and you expelled the outsiders. You were hostile, you were greedy, and you were a liar. Now, a subject that's received little attention is what about Jews on Crete? We know that they were there. First Maccabees 15 records Greeks being at the capital, at, well, what would become the capital, Gorton. Philo, on, his, on the embassy of Gaius, writes that Crete is full of Jews. This is in the first, early first century CE. Josephus, after recording that he divorced his wife because, of, because her behavior displeased him, he, that's, that's really funny. He <laughs> just says, I didn't like what she was doing, so I, I divorced her. He <laughs> states that he then married a Jewess from Crete, and he says this, she came from, a very, di from very distinguished parents, indeed the most notable people in that country. Now we have, and in Acts 2 also records Jews from Crete. But interestingly, we have little to no archaeological evidence that they were there before the 5th century CE. Hmm. We have some early records of a few names that were mentioned, and they're not all entirely clear that they were actually Jews, um, but they likely were. So no archaeological evidence that they were there, other than those three inscriptions. Now, Jews in the diaspora were quite an accommodating bunch of people. We often get the picture that Jews were Jews. They did not like to accommodate to anything. That's not the picture that we get from the, from the Jewish literature. We see them accommodating quite heavily to Greek culture. For, take 1 Maccabees 12, for instance. Here we have the Maccabees dealing with Sparta. What they're really trying to deal with at this point is, propag is propaganda for building up the, the um, Maccabean regime and trying to legitimate their country as separate from the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. But this is what he says in their, in their letter to the Spartans. The high priest Jonathan, the, the senate of the nation, the priests, and the rest of the Jewish people to their brothers the Spartans' greetings. Now, it's not uncommon for people at this time to, in their diplomatic discourse, to call kings and of other nations brothers. That was common discourse. But this letter goes on to, to make it an even further statement of, of genealogy. Here we have the Spartans writing back, King Arius of the Spartans to the high priest Onias, greetings. It has been found in writing concerning the Spartans and the Jews that they are brothers and are of the family of Abraham. The Jews are writing here that the Spartans, a Greek people, are in fact descended from Abraham. Now it's entirely likely that this was a forgery. These letters never actually existed except in the book of First Maccabees. But Gruen notes, and he's correct on this, that the fact that the linkage was conceived and broadcast remains fundamental. So whether or not it was accurate, they were portraying it as being accurate. Um, whether or not any Spartan ever acknowledged the concocted kinship, Jews had calculatingly fashioned an affiliation with a Gentile people that enhanced their <coughs> own self-image. They were enhancing who they were by claiming kinship with a Greek nation. Cleodemus Malchus in the second century BC, he writes the following, Cleodemus the prophet, who was also called Malchus, 
who wrote a history of the Jews in agreement with the history of Moses, their legislature, legislator, relates that there were many sons born to Abraham by Keturah. Nay, the names, three of them, Afer and Surim and Japhron, that from Surim was the land of Assyria named, and that from the other two, Afer and Japhron, the country of Africa took its name, because these men were auxiliaries to Heracles when he fought against Libya and Antaeus, and that Heracles married Afra's daughter, and of her he begat a son, Diodorus, and that of Saphon, Saphon was his son. Here we have children of Abraham marrying the Greek demigod Heracles. <coughs> we find that they're doing, more, they're doing much more than just a, a tipping their hat toward the Jews. They're connecting themselves genealogically to the Greeks. Second Maccabees. Now, Second Maccabees is not condoning the behavior that it's saying, but it is recording that it did, that this happened. It said when the quadrennial games were being held at Tyre and the king was present, the vile Jason, who was high priest at this time, sent envoys chosen as being Antiochian citizens from Jerusalem to carry three hundred silver drachmas for the sacrifice to Heracles. We have the high priest of the Jews sending sacrifices to a Greek demigod. Eupolemus in the second century BCE writes, <coughs> and, and Eupolemus was likely high in the court of the Maccabees. This seems to be the general consensus that this was an actual Jew who was high up within the ranks of the Jewish people. He says, and for Sauron, that's his name for Solomon, sent Tyre the golden column, which is set up in Tyre in the temple of Zeus. So we have the King Solomon helping to build a temple to Zeus. Furthermore, we have the letter of Aristeus saying, oh, you call, we call our God Yahweh, but you call the same God Zeus or Jupiter. They were okay with, or at least some of them were okay with calling Yahweh Zeus. So it is not unlikely that in this situation we find little to no evidence that Jews were on Crete. But we do find, we do know from literary sources that they were there. And given the larger surrounding culture, it is not unlikely that the Jews were actually passing themselves off as Crete that they were accommodating quite heavily to the Cretan culture. And this would not have been that difficult, in fact, because the Cretans themselves didn't eat pork. This was a big deal, you know, because the Romans loved pork. Uh, and who wouldn't love pork? But, <laughs> but the Jews and the Cretans didn't. Further, we find throughout Crete, as we do in Asia Minor and elsewhere, the inscriptions to Theos Upsistos which was also appropriated by the Jews. Now that one's a little out, that may not be something that they were doing, but it's, it's a likely situation for Roman Crete. All right, so how does this all apply to the letter of Titus? We talked a lot about how, what the Cretans were doing, what the Jews were doing, what they looked like. So let's go to the letter to Titus. In chapter one, we find the first description of the opponents, um, verses 10 through 16. And here it says that, for there are many who are insubordinate. He uses that word to describe what the elders' children are not to be, putting these people in direct contradistinction to, to the inside group. So they are insubordinate. They have vain speech. They are deceivers, especially those from the circumcision, whom it is necessary to silence who topple whole households teaching what they ought not on account of dishonest gain. One of their own prophets says, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. That's what it says. And on account of this, rebuke them sharply in order that they may be sound in faith, not holding to Jewish myths and commands of men which lead astray from the truth. All things are clean to the unclean, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is clean, but they have defiled their minds and their consciences. They profess to know God, but through their works, they 
deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unapproved for every good word. Now important here is this in verse 12 where he talks about Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Notice he's pulling on these Cretan stereotypes. Cretans are always liars. Well, everyone in the ancient world would know that. They're evil beasts. Interestingly, there were no um, predators on the island of Crete. So who are the beasts on Crete? The humans. Because they're, they're a warring type of people. And they're lazy gluttons. So they, they can't get enough. Their greed is insatiable. And then interestingly, this testimony is true. Now think about that. One of their own prophets, this is a Cretan, it comes from Epimenides, likely between 500 and 600 BCE. We don't actually have any of Epi have this recorded in Epimenides. The ancients knew that it was from Epimenides, but his works didn't survive. So we don't know the exact context. Callimachus repeats this. But we have a Cretan saying all, Cre all Cretans are liars, and then this testimony is true. So if all Cretans are liars and a Cretan is calling a Cretan a liar, how is that true? <laughs> Nice paradox that has caused a lot of literature to stand. But what's going on here is he's, call, he's, he's calling true what everyone already knew. He's talking about something that was passed on. Everyone already knew this. Now, interestingly, he calls them one of their own prophets. And he's talking about those, the opponents. But within this, the opponents, he says, especially those of the circumcision. So here we have not only Cretans, but Jews called Cretans within this very letter. That within this group, the way that the letter is conceiving of the opponents is Cretans with a subgroup of those of the circumcision, somehow subsumed under this larger category of Cretan. So, what are we to do with this? Well, There are three elements here that relate to the Jews. The commands of men. That's very vague. May not actually be Jews. Remember the Cretans had their own law code. Commands of men would have been very would have fit nicely with a Cretan setting. Would have also fit nicely with a Jewish setting. It's just equivocal. It's not clear what that's talking about. Those of the circumcision, quite close to being Jewish. Also, again, Probably 95% sure is Jewish. Now remember, there are other Yahwistic cults out there that practice circumcision. So it may not have actually been Jews, but it's likely that it included them. But it talks about Jewish myths. So what are these Jewish myths? In light of the, dias the diasporic literature and what we find in the archaeology, what we find in the letter of Titus itself, it's likely that these Jewish myths were Jews connecting themselves with Cretans and seeing that as their primary identity, rather than that in the account of who they were from the Old Testament, being a people of God. Although they may have still worshipped Yahweh, they were passing themselves off as Cretan. So one of the likely things that the letter is telling, is warning against, is this over-assimilation over taking in of the surrounding culture. Now, what it is not doing, it is not saying that we do not, in some way, take over some of the surrounding culture. Chapter 2, right after talking about these Jewish myths, he goes into chapter 2, which is a household code. And here, we have a very distinct household code. It is fascinating. We have the old men and the old women set up next to each other. Very similar to the Cretan setting. This is different from all of the other household codes in the New Testament. You don't have the normal pairs. You don't have husband, wife, parent, child. You have old men, old women. You have the men teaching the men, the women teaching the women here. We have, again, old women teaching young women to be workers at home, which was expected in the Cretan setting. 
we have men teaching young men, which was expected in the Cretan setting. So what we have here is this confrontation with the culture that's going on in this letter. He is telling us that we have to be careful not to overdo it with going into the culture, but there is a large degree to which we overtake the ideas that are surrounding us in the culture. And I'll stop there. Any questions? Comments? Thoughts? I read before that uh, that some people claim that the bill scenes came from Crete. Do you agree with that? Um, I don't know enough about that. Dr. Ring, hmm. um, they came from the Gene world. That's correct. Uh, they're likely a combination of folk from that they pick up and join the community from Cyprus, from uh, the, the Mycenaean state at that point. Crete was under Mycenae at that point, the Mycenaean world, and uh, from Anatolia. So it's a, it's a conglomerate people that the Egyptian Ramses III is going to call the Pelashim. Uh, you'll see echoes of this in Daniel where he speaks about, in Numbers, where the Philistines are seen to come from Kaftor, which is actually named for Cyprus. That actually matched up archaeologically, but they went there first and as part of the process. So, yeah, they're Cretan elements, but they're not directly from Crete. Sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> and the Mycenaeans were a different people from the Cretans that were at this time. It was a different culture. So all from the same geographic area. There. Do a question yeah. for you. Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, superb job. Thank you. Very well done. Um, general biblical scholarship tends to reject a Cretan setting. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Well, it's... What's their logic? Behind? Well, the logic has to do with pseudonymity. So if you're not, not familiar with this, it, it, within Pauline scholarship, only seven of the letters are considered genuine in Pauline. The pastorals are rejected as being written by Paul, and um, Ephesians and Colossians are generally rejected in 2 Thessalonians as well. And so, within the logic here, Titus was not written by Paul. Therefore, it opens the door to not only to pseudonymity, but to double pseudonymity, which means that not only did Paul not write it, but it cannot have been written to Titus or to the setting that it, that it can. That, that it purports to be written to. And so that's how the logic tends to go. <coughs> and the reason that I'm saying that that is false is because, like I said, chapter two lines up nearly identically to, to a Cretan setting, the way that the Cretans structured their society, which is one of the few areas in the, in the book where you get an actual view into the setting. So I think this, fit, and it doesn't really fit the, the outside Greek world. It fits Crete well, but not elsewhere. Would you say then that most of those scholars don't understand the first century world of Crete? <laughs> of course. <laughs> what do you say? You, you made a statement, mm -hmm. uh, one I would have to uh, have a bit of an issue with. Okay. When you said that um, Cretans almost uniformly rejected Roman culture. Did I say it that starkly? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> that is not what I meant. Because at Gorton, they actually asked for a, an imperial temple. So it was not a uniform rejection. But there were at well, least... How, how would you mark the... What do you think the divider was about that negotiated rejection acceptance? What would, you, what would you think marks mark that, that those communities? What was the divider? Oh, that that's a hard one because um, the two main areas that we have research for is Knossos and, and Gorton, and they're very different in their relationship to Rome. Knossos was probably very bitter over having a Roman colony taken, set, put there, all of their lands given to Italians, and basically left with nothing. So it was probably had to do with a bitterness toward Rome, period. Um, well, not period, but in addition to 
to other things. Gorton, on the other side, actually asked for Rome to come in, and they were they were accepting of Rome. So more of an elite, elite right. Cretan acceptance and a right. sub-elite rejection. So right. Sort of right. Which seems to be what you see elsewhere as well. Yeah, the elites. The okay. Yeah. So you mentioned the, sorry, anybody else want to ask? That's fine. The, that the culture dictated that the reason why Paul instructed Titus to have the women teach the women and the men teach the men, you think that's purely based on their adjustment to the culture, or you think that's a biblical background that has, you know, precedence for them to establish families and the way things should be taught in the family? Well, yeah, that's a hard question. Um, because elsewhere we don't see this sort of setting up, but elsewhere we don't see it tonight either. So I think the way that he is constructing it <coughs> is doing it structurally based on the way that they, I'm not saying that the culture dictated it. Um, this was something which was permissible within the, the Christian idea, that what it meant to be a Christian. This is not in any way opposed to being a Christian. And so I'm, I think that what he's saying is this is acceptable in light of the Christ event, in light of who we are as Christians. Because he's not simply taking over the Cretan setting. He, he's also interacting with is there are some other places, like, like he tells the women not to be um, gossips or not to be devils, even though they were known to be quite, um, they, were, they were liars, they were all sorts of other things. So it's not a sim simply just taking over the culture, but it's an interaction with it, if that makes sense. So it's not unacceptable to, to take this today. Is that where you were getting with? I guess, because I, I, you know, thinking through Titus and just trying to establish, you know, why, why is it in Titus that Paul is saying that the women should teach the women, the men should teach the men? Like, right. what's the impetus for that? Is it because the women played a role in culture that they wanted to more, like, shape toward what was more biblical, or is it, you know, were, were they addressing specific issues that they saw that they were trying to correct, or were they, according to what you're saying, yeah. did it kind of fit in with the cultural norms? So they were just saying, you know, it's not teaching them something different about the structure of instruction in the church. It's more right. just, this is how it'll work better in their culture. It's where you can have the women teach these things to the women, and the men teach these things to the men. And then, like, obviously, if he's addressing certain issues and saying, you need to teach these women to do these things, yeah. Would that say that on the other, if they were not, the women were not acting in accord to what those instructions were teaching them that they should teach according to sound doctrine, right? Because mm -hmm. like it talks about sound doctrine is what you need to teach. Mm -hmm. So right. like how does that interact with what we can learn about women in the culture? How mm -hmm. do women act in the culture at the time? Yeah. There's maybe not enough evidence for us to know that. So we're just right. So. Right, so I think a lot of how this is set up has to do with the, with the cultural background. Um, now there are some, like Bruce Winter, who wants to say that this is because of the Roman new woman, and that there's a problem with women in the Roman world because they're overtaking Roman culture quite heavily, and he's wanting to pull back to a more, uh, the, the author here is wanting to pull back to a more um, conservative position. Uh, however, Bruce Winter is not interacting with the the current research on Roman Crete. And I believe he takes one statement in a book and runs with it instead of seeing how it's how it's um, worked out. Yeah, because so. I've read that too, that the women, mm -hmm. that it was possible that the women were acting in ways that were um, making like men be somewhat subordinate in, right. you know, mm -hmm. in cultural in interactions with each other. Right. So, and then you're just saying that you think that's just his opinion that's over. I think he's overreaching. I think he's trying to read Roman culture a little too much into Greek. I think a lot of what he says makes sense for a lot of other settings. I think in this one, he doesn't quite read his sources quite um, um, nuanced enough. His discussion of what's going on is not nuanced enough. That may be the case in like Gorgian, but it would almost definitely not be the case in the Knossos, except in the actual colony where it was Roman. I think it's more combinational too. You could see it as um, this is, in a way, the ease doesn't 
doesn't create hurdles for the gospel. Mm -hmm. That the gospel is used in the cultural structure where it is simply a neutralist space, where it's not a negative thing to Christianity. And uh, I think that's why uh, the letter writer is, is reinforcing that, saying, look, this is okay. This is okay. You women keep doing this, keep, but, but do this in a moral way, do this in a Christian way. Mm -hmm. Instruct them in Christian faith, in Christian walk, and, and, and the way a Christian woman functions. Elders do the same thing. Instruct the young men what it means to be a Christian man, what it means to be a new creature. And so I think he doesn't have to challenge the structure because it, it, it works. Okay? It raises less of a hurdle to say, don't do what you're doing. This allows them to feel more comfortable as they express their Christianity. And that's really what the thrust in many ways of Titus is, is accept that you're, you know, be that Christian means to be a new creature, but it also means to be that your identity is new, but you can still function within your culture. That's just jumping the throat. I agree. <laughs> No, no, that's fine, that's fine. What about the, um, the argument that there were Jews at Pentecost that were the ones that actually took Christianity to Crete? Yeah, I think that's right. Versus Paul's journey. Mm -hmm. Some say Paul established the church, but you, you think that the Jews went and then Paul met up with them? Right, them? Like, exactly. I don't I don't think that Paul um, started the church on Crete. I think that when he came into the Cretan world, there was already a church established. Because you're right, in, in, in Acts 2, that you talk about Jews from Crete. Yeah. We address our network theory in the to the spread of the gospel. What's that? We address our network theory in relates to the spread of the gospel. Oh, I'm not comfortable discussing network theory. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You will be eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I know you didn't address this. Thank you for your presentation, Blake. Uh, how, how do you... Uh, I know you address this elsewhere in our conversations yeah, yeah. and places, but how do you address the uh, traditional view of most commentators on Titus that there weren't uh, mature enough Christians to be leaders of the churches there? Yeah. Um, so. Like Mounts. Right. So they're, they're looking at, at 1 Timothy and, and saying that because it doesn't repeat the, the phrase, um, new converts are not to be pastors, that therefore they can be pastors. Well, what I think about that is there are certain things in, in the uh, list in 1, 5 through 8, or through 9, where it talks about they have to be, where is it, in verse 8, that those who want to be bishops have to be um, self-controlled, righteous, and holy. And in order for that to be the case, I mean, we're not talking about holy as in hagia, we're talking hasioi, um, something that is an outward expression of holiness. And so for them to not be mature enough, I mean, I, I believe that that necessitates a certain level of maturity that a, that a new convert cannot express. And the way that the, um, the opponents, they say they're unapproved for any good work. The fact that they're unapproved implies it's opposite, that there has to be some sort of approval. And so in order for someone to meet some sort of approval, they would have to be a certain level of maturity. So I think Titus doesn't need to repeat that phrase because there are other elements within, uh, within the discourse that point toward that reality. So then a uh, follow-up question, why, yeah. why then do they dismiss the evidence from Acts once again, <laughs> Acts is seen as a second century work. Yeah. I mean, now it's being evangelical. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that he does that. Right, and you're right, that is interesting that, that no one really brings up the, the issue of Acts. Um, but you can read my article on that. <laughs> I don't know why they dismiss the stuff from Acts. I think that they're trying to do it mainly. I think a lot of it has to do with an impetus toward missions and towards saying that, toward this impetus toward 
we're going to spread the gospel throughout all the world, and no one can, no one has the right to hear the gospel twice until everyone has heard it once. And so they're getting this from Titus, saying, "Oh, we can put new converts in the position of pastor, and it justifies our missiology." And so I think a lot of it has to do with a missiological reason instead of a, a true biblical exegetical. All right, our time is up if you right. want to... Uh, <laughs>